All right, so let's make sure you guys can hear me. That's, that's fine. Okay, so I'm glad that we have some people around to talk about Spark. It's a really interesting technology. And hopefully this will get you guys to learn a couple of things, but I also want to learn from you if you guys have used it. Be sure to talk to me after the talk and let's uh, exchange some knowledge. So this will be a story about how we've been using it uh, at uh, Fidzai and how we've banged our heads a few times and then get to learn how to do the right thing. And so hopefully this is a story that applies for a lot of people too, in the sense that um, maybe you are a user, you learn about Spark, it's really interesting and all, you're all excited about it. You want to bring it back to your company, uh, apply it, but after a while it's this huge machine, lots of tuning knobs and you're not really sure what to do, so it takes a while for you to get through all the hassle, the problems, and eventually you get to success because it's a nice platform, it delivers, it's just getting really complex. And so what I want to help you is maybe to exchange a bit of experiences and help you skip these banging parts and, and get to the success faster. And so just getting a one-on-one -on, -one on Spark really quick to make sure we're all on the same page. On, on a nutshell, it's a distributed data processing platform. And so it's distributed because it allows you to process lots of data in a distributed fashion, fault tolerant, and of course the data can come from many places. People use it most of the time from HDFS, but it can connect to pretty much any reasonably known database in these days. And in the processing term here, it comes from the sense that you usually transform data. You typically want to aggregate it and end up with something that is more meaningful but smaller than what you started with. And so a very typical program used to present Spark and other similar platforms is this word count. And you guys can pretty much read through it without my help. You don't you don't know how it will work underneath, but you can see that it's going to split sentences into words, and then it will give a count of one to each one, and eventually these will be reduced so that the same words will, will have all the counts together, and you end up knowing how many times each word appears. Of course, this is kind of easy to do in a single machine, but if you now have terabytes of documents to go through, it will no longer be feasible. Maybe they don't even fit in a single machine. And so what Spark and other similar pl platforms enable you to do is that you have these lots of data spread across many machines. They go through Spark. Spark is probably installed in those very same machines. And in the end, you have few amounts of data, but they are more meaningful, as I was saying just a while ago. And so at Fidzai, it is almost the same, in the sense that we, as a platform, we ingest real-time data and provide feedback our most known use case is that of fraud detection. And we have many internal components that are doing lots of different things. One of them are machine learning algorithms. And so we use it as one of the tools in our Swiss Army Knife, and we use it to help predict if a given transaction is fraudulent or not. And the thing is that to use a machine learning model in these days, you have to do lots of things. And uh, you know, like machine learning has helped us getting known, lots of nice people, think and say we are good, and hopefully that's true. But what matters is if you're a data scientist and you're on the field handling terabytes of data, you will most likely go through this pipeline. You get some historical data from a bank, a client, whatever, and you, so, you start to have to clean it. You, this cleaning up is already non-trivial since you have so much data to go through. Maybe you start to get other stream of data. It's not just that. Now it, you have another data with a different layout, and you want interesting pieces of both. So now you have to join all this data across a huge terabyte, multi-terabyte data set. And then you have to do the so-called data understanding. So this is basically the data scientist has to really get, get the, an, a feeling of what's going in the data. Otherwise, he's not going to create a good machine learning model. And this data understanding will hopefully lead him to a good feature generation. Feature is basically the units that you feed to a machine learning model for him to train and then predict. He gets a machine learning model and then evaluates it and you go through this many times. So as a data scientist, you will quickly realize that you will be spending most of your time on this loop. And so, as you see, in your daily life, you'll be really do processing terabytes of data per day as a data scientist. Not, it's not just the thing that Facebook does, as my colleagues were saying. And, and as companies across the world are understanding the power of data, they have more employees doing these and thus 
Spark gains more traction and importance because it enables you to do this at scale. And so let's try to understand what the life cycle of a Spark program. So you write it in your computer, maybe in Scala or the Python API, and you then start it in a JVM, uh, and this will, call, will start, start the so-called driver. Basically, it's going to request stuff from a cluster manager. So hopefully you have a large cluster, otherwise you're going to go through problems. And in this large cluster, you have a manager, which is, of course, managing the resources, knowing where to schedule new jobs that are coming. And so it will start an application manager. And so if you've used Spark, you know these terms, you're getting familiar with these. If you haven't used it, it's more or less trivial so far. And then what the application manager will do is to spawn the so-called Spark executors. And these Spark executors will live on different machines and will be able to process tasks. And tasks are the minimum units of a Spark program. We'll be getting to that. So usually what the, each Spark task will do inside an executor is start to fetch data. Of course, you can go old school and fetch it from Postgres in a single machine, but if you really have a huge data set, most likely it's distributed and replicated. For instance, on HDFS, the Hadoop file system. And so this will typically be a usual deployment where we have Spark and data co-located so that each Spark executor will be processing a part of the data which is co-located with it and you avoid data transferring over the network so that you only then transfer the really aggregated data that has meaning for you. Because of course in a distributed system the network is your worst enemy all the time. And so underlying this kind of deployment architecture are a couple of key design decisions that has made, have made Spark really known and work in practice really good. And these are the fact that it holds as much data in memory as it can. So even though your data is on disk somewhere, at the point you bring it up into a Spark executor, until the end you get the result, it will live mostly in memory if possible, of course. It depends on how much memory you have in your machines. And this is really good for the kind of workloads we have these days on these analytics, understanding, and uh, even machine learning algorithms, which are often iterative algorithms, which have to go through the same data over and over again. So it's really good to have it in memory. And this also matches the fact that Spark executors are long-lived. So if your job is going to take 12 hours, which is not unreasonable for a huge amount of data, your, each Spark executor will be there from the, end, from the start to the end, unless it fails, of course, and the fault tolerance kicks in. And this is very different from the old MapReduce uh, school, which we had like 10, almost 15 years ago, I, no, 10 years ago. And because in MapReduce, each task would be a new JVM, bootstrap from nothing, read from disk, write to disk, die, and that's it. And it would be really terrible for huge jobs. And with Spark, the idea is to keep things living as long as possible and just reuse what you've done so far. And so this reduces a lot of overhead, basically. It's simple but effective in that sense. And then uh, the way it deals with failures is also uh, very different from MapReduce because as I was saying, the old MapReduce would always write to disk as soon as you had any intermediate result, let it go through disk to another machine, typically through a distributed file system. It's really costly. And here the idea, of course, is if we, is to going to be an optimistic assumption in the sense that let's assume failures happen very rarely, and in practice, hopefully they do. Uh, and this means that if you have a failure, you will not have pretty much anything in disk. Maybe you have even to go from scratch to start from what you had in the input. But you will only be doing that for the minimum necessary. And here the idea is that if you have different portions of your data set split across machines, and at this point a machine fails, and you need this result back, you will only recompute what's in green. Of course, you don't probably have to read the whole data, just a portion. But Spark is optimistic in that sense. It's going to know how to rebuild data, and if it loses the data, it reconstructs it from scratch if needed. We'll see it's not that hardcore in many cases. But the idea is this. And in practice, it's better than Hadoop, because in MapReduce, you would always be writing to disk at the end of each stage, and you see most of the time you don't fail. I can tell you from experience, if you have a 20,000 task job, you will have 100 failures in a normal cluster. The cluster is running just fine. 100 failures will still happen, but this is a very small percentage. And so basically these, all these key designs give you a system which is scalable in the sense that if you start with a small amount of data, maybe it even fits one machine, and you're happy, 
but tomorrow you have an ever-growing amount of data, which is what happens this day, you can just pump in more hardware and things will scale. And that's great because this is the so-called scalable performance in which you scale horizontally and you don't really worry about tomorrow. It's just a matter of putting more machines. And this actually works when you have an embarrassingly parallel program, which most of the time is the case in Spark. And so these primitives are known in different types of languages and different systems. They more or less have the meaning you expect if you've been programming in the last 10 years and you know about them. But, and, and they are embarrassingly parallel. And so they fit this model, it will scale nicely. Don't, take the, the mis don't make the mistake of, of thinking that this is actually easy to do even at scale. So even an embarrassingly parallel program, given a sufficiently large scale, will be difficult to manage because of the failures I just talked about. And they will happen. They are simple things like timeouts that you would assume they would never happen, but given a highly pressured enough cluster, they will surely happen eventually. But um, there are problems. And so basically for the rest of the presentation, I will now start to talk about the dark sides of Spark. And so we are in a bit of a bluish moon here in the sense that not everything is perfect. And what I want to help you guys understand is if you find yourself with these problems, there's a solution. So the guys behind Spark are really smart and they've solved a lot of problems. It's just not easy to get to know the solutions if you're starting with Spark. So Problem number one, distributed shuffles. And so let's actually see what's a shuffle. So if you have a program in Spark, and let's use the example I was talking about before, where you have historical data, then you maybe want to clean it up. And let's say that your data is lots of rows, each row has a column ID, and then other columns. You see, basically, it doesn't really matter for the purpose. Then you have other historical data, where you have also the same ID, and maybe other IDs, other data, and you actually want to join them. And now you want to end up with rows which have these transaction ID and the columns of both sides, right? Typical join, most of you probably know what I'm saying. And how does Spark actually manage this? So if you have multi-terabyte data of this side on this side and they are spread across your HDFS, and Spark basically wants to give you these results, all rows with the same transaction ID must be processed in the same Spark task so that you have full visibility of the values that exist for that transaction ID and you want to join them. Basically, this will do a distributed shuffle. And the distributed shuffle is a kind of all-to-all -all flow of communication. You can imagine that if you are processing a bit of data here, you are processing 10 rows and you may find 10 transaction IDs which have to be processed by the same Spark task. But because you don't want everything to execute in a single machine, it's a distributed system, you may have to talk to 10 other tasks. So ultimately, you could conceive that a very unbalanced uh, uh, data set could de demand an all-to-all -all communication. And exactly when do these shuffles happen? They are your, uh, one of your worst enemies in Spark, and, but they eventually have to happen if you're doing interesting things with Spark. And if you issue join, scoop group, sort, or group buys, these kind of primitives in Spark will underneath kick in the shuffle machinery. And usually, for any Spark program, the shuffle is where it will spend most of the time. And actually for a platform of, of this kind to be efficient and work in practice, the shuffle is where they really have to have the most efficient algorithms. And so what can you do about shuffles? So there's various algorithms in Spark for shuffling. They try to use the best one for your program. They are as smart as possible. But ultimately, you as a user can screw up its performance by doing mistakes. And so one of the things I can tell you, for instance, is about the by key operations. So you can use reduce by key in a Spark program or a group by key. And although you look at them and the API seems to be reasonably the same, they are doing very different things. So with the group by, let's say that you have different map tasks processing portions of your huge data set. And your data set are a letter and a number. And what you may want to do with this is actually to forward all the same rows for the same letter to the same Spark task, sum them up, and end up with the result on the right. And what the problem if you use a group by key is that each of these map tasks on the left will simply pick up the data, see where they need to forward it to, and send it over. And because of this, you can see that this guy here is sending two ways with the ones on the right. Of course, this is a simple example. It could be sending millions of A's. And you can do a smarter thing, and it is possible to do that. It's just calling reduce by key. Because reduce by key 
actually does the reduction both on the mapper side and then on the reducer side. So each of the mappers on the, on the left will reduce the A's, send them together, and if there were more A's here, they would reduce them and send them. And then here you'd reduce let all the data together. But what matters is that when you send it over, you send much less data. Of course, once again, simple example, you can escalate it to an arbitrarily large problem. But a very simple change in your program can have an order of magnitude of performance difference. Another thing you can do when you have distributed shuffles is to use broadcasts. And the, the idea here really is that you have a program with a shuffle and then you turn it into a program without the shuffle. So it's much better, of course. And the idea is that you can do this if one of the sides of your join is small enough. So let's say that you have the same data set and some mappers on your Spark processing parcels of the data. And now you have your driver where you have access to the, one of the, the data sets that you want to join. And let's say that this is much smaller than that. You could have a million of map tasks here processing lots of data. What you do is you broadcast all of these small data sets to each of the mappers, and they have the other side there, so they join locally. Once again, damn simple idea, but you just avoid a lot of shuffling, and that's huge, because shuffling the, this left side would be a huge effort in Spark. Of course, you have to be reasonable about what you broadcast, but Spark is also good at broadcasting. It uses a kind of BitTorrent uh, algorithm, you can imagine. It's a peer-to-peer -peer distribution of the data, so it's not going to be these drivers sending over the data to all of the mappers. So it will be quite effective. Another thing you can do is the tree reduce. So what, what, where does it matter? Let's say that you have some mappers which have processed data, and now you have these tokens on the output of the mappers, and you want to collect them so that in your final result of the program, which is computed on the driver, only one driver exists, you end up with the concatenation of these. Simple example. So if you had a million of these map tests, they would be all sending the data back to the driver, and the driver would be linearly computing these and concatenating. And you can get to a really bottleneck in your program. Even if you're distributing, you have bazillions of tasks before, but then it's bottlenecks here on the driver. And some people really don't know about this part here. And the idea is very simple. Instead of doing a reduce you, or a collect, you can use the tree version of it, which basically is going to create more mappers in between, perform the same reduction that happens on the driver, but perform it with intermediate steps. And you can control the depth of this tree which of course you're trading off the fact that you have to spawn off more mappers, have the communication among them, and typically these will run the same, in the same machine where those were, and, uh, and you're trading that off. But you're switching from this linear problem that you had here to one where you parallelize it among tasks and it will be logarithmic. Finally, uh, still in shuffling, if you have a very unbalanced data set, let's say that in this case, all of these guys wanted to reduce things for A, and you know that they have to be processed in the same task so that it has full visibility of the A. Well, you could do a kind of tree aggregation reduction as well, uh, but you can do another thing. And here the idea is if you don't want these all to be processed by these shuffle tasks, and you want the other ones to be used, you can do a kind of uh, controllable tree aggregation and reduction. And the idea is that you will take each of these rows and you will kind of hash them or salt them, anything that mutates the key in a deterministic way, so that you then forward these to many nodes because A becomes another thing, maybe based on other columns, and then you forward them to all mapper, all shuffles. And then on the other side, you will have to have more things. Basically, because you now distributed the data, you have to bring it together again. But the good news is that because you distributed these, they will be mostly reduced here, and the output of these will be much smaller. So when you then have to shuffle everything back together because you kind of unsalt or unhash, it will be much less data. And so this is a bit more manual work. There's no real primitive for Spark to do this because it depends on your semantics of your data. But if you can come up with a way to deterministically transform the key and go one way and back, then you can use this trick. And it's really a problem solver in many cases. All right, so data shuffles are more or less uh, a problem. You guys now are aware of that. You know some tricks in your baggage. You can use them. Uh, another thing that you have to be aware of is data serialization in Spark. 
So serialization can happen in two ways. And basically serialization here, if you're from Java, Java world, you know it. Uh, the idea is that you want to transform data into a canonic format that is independent of your execution runtime. And, um, and the, this is used in Spark in one case for shuffling because it may need to send things over the wire or write it to the distributed um, file system. And here it's really needed. You have to do it. Uh, Spark has to do it. Or in another case, you might, it might be needed when you cache data. And we'll be talking about data caching in a bit, but the idea is that Spark keeps data in memory and it will keep it for longer if you ask for it, if you know it's better. And the, to do so, it may need to store this data into disk. Depends on if you cache in memory, if you cache on disk, and if you serialize or not. If you serialize, you can compress it so you use less storage and it's better. But so what matters about serialization here is that you should use a different serializer from the default one of Spark. So Spark provides the whole infrastructure for you to use Cryo, it's a different serializer, but it doesn't use it by default. And as far as we've seen in a lot of scenarios, it's always the better, uh, always better or the same. So you don't lose anything by using Cryo. And the intuition of why Cryo is better here is the following, is that with Java serialization, it basically writes down uh, the fully qualified name of the class, the, son, the serial UID, it goes up the hierarchy, does the same for all the, sub, the parents, and writes some other metadata, even some useless bytes that are there for legacy reasons, it's a bloat. And basically you have to remember that Spark, that the Java serialization is meant for long-lived and backwards compatible storage. So they really have to be concerned and careful about that because think, people will write stuff serialized and want to read it in 10 versions of Java and still work. But with Cryo, uh, they are aiming for a different use case, which is the one that matches Spark, is that you're only serializing data for transient reasons. You're not going to keep it serialized in a persistent format forever. It's just to send over the wire for some other machine to use or to cache it. And so they basically created a simple algorithm because it doesn't have to be as complex. And so if you want to make the best usage of, usage of Cryo, you're going to have to have a little bit of work, but it really pays off because the simplest thing that Cryo can do is the following. You register each class that you want to serialize. For instance, you know you're going to have lots of maps in your RDDs. So you can register map into Cryo. And what Cryo does, it associates a number with that class. One, for instance. And then when it wants to serialize an instance, an object of that class, just writes one and then each value of the fields in a deterministic order obtained by reflection or an instrumented version of your code. Depends on how you use Cryo. It's just a configuration. But so what this means is that you basically, instead of writing like 200 bytes, you can write very few, depending on the number it gets associated with it, and you're done. And that's really an, a huge improvement. Can give you an order of magnitude improvement in terms of performance. And so you have to basically do this if you really want to for the classes that the, you have more often in your rows that go through Spark. And, of course, Spark is smart enough to already pre-register some of the classes it uses and that appear more often. Um, if you go to the basic usage of Cryo, uh, or which is basically you don't do anything, you just enable it, it's still going to write the fully qualified name of the class, of course, so that it can identify it. But it's still less than the overall metadata that uh, Java serialization does by default, so you're still winning. Um, you can also do cryo uh, serialization on your own. So if you have a class which you know you can serialize in a smarter way because you don't really need to send everything over, then you can just write a very simple custom serializer for it and it will seriously improve your performance as well. We've had to do that to improve uh, performance. We knew we had a class which was appearing very often. We improved that and it helped performance over 50%. Because serialization happens a lot during shuffles. Shuffles are the most expensive part and you get why this is important. So you can even save more storage, more network, and so on, but you may actually have to do this for correctness. So we found out that at some point we were collecting throwables, so it's a kind of Java exception, Java error. We were collecting them in our Java um, Spark program because we wanted to also collect the errors we were finding in some data and so on, doesn't really matter. But what happens is that the throwable can have a field, which is the cause that caused it, and this can actually point to itself. It can have a self-reference. It's internal implementation of the throwable class. And why did we find about it? Because 
in cryo, if you don't enable a given configuration, it is not going to keep track of circular dependencies. So it was basically going into a circular recursion, stack overflow, yada, yada. And so the, what we did basically, we did a custom serialization for the trouble, we solved the problem, it's done. But what you could have done is to enable cryo to keep track of circular dependencies. If you want to have the least work, you enable it, it will work in practice. Of course, you're paying an extra cost. Cry is going to have to keep this graph for all the objects it's serializing. It's an added overhead. And you can skip it if you use custom serialization. This is a problem you may find yourself, so be aware of it. Another problem, so how to deal with data caching. What is data caching? Some people use Spark and never call cache, which surprises me. But uh, let's see why it's important. So let's say that you have a pipeline of data processing going through Spark, you clean your data, and now you are filtering it and then computing some interesting thing that you reduce to the driver. But maybe you want also to compute another thing over this data in which if you find a given piece of data, you want to consider it in error and send to a Postgres database. So you kind of have a fork in your pipeline of data processing. And what is going to happen with Spark is that each machine in Spark is going to be processing a bit of the data and processing each of these steps. If there's no shuffle, it's the same Spark executor doing the full pipeline for a given piece of data in a Spark task. But if you have this fork, then when it gets here, it says, oh, I actually need that data again, which I did not have in memory. So it goes back, reads back the data, and now goes back up. And because reading data from a distributed file system or writing is one of the most expensive parts, it's slower. And so what you can do, it's really simple, is tell Spark, I know I'm going to reuse this data. So at this point, please cache it. And caching, as you know, is a best effort. It's going to do as much as possible to keep it in memory. But if there's memory pressure, it's going to throw it away, of course, and not go out of memory. But this is a really powerful thing which can speed up your program a lot. And you have to be, this is one of those cases where you really have to provide good hints to your Spark program because it's still not very good at understanding what you're doing and caching in the right places. But for you to do a good job at hinting Spark, you have to understand how memory is managed in Spark. And here, it's fairly simple. You just have to learn it once and you will remember forever. So basically, there's a piece of the memory in each JVM that is owned by Spark Executor, which is reserved memory. It's there just as a kind of slack. You can't use it. You can't change it. It's just there. But be aware, because if you do some math to predict how much you'll be using or needing, there's these 300 megabytes. It's hard-coded in Spark. You can change it and recompile it if you wish. And then you have user memory. And this is basically the heap of your JVM minus the reserve memory times 25%. And this is nothing you can change, once again, unless you reconfigure Spark via and recompile it. And, and this user memory is basically memory that will be there for you to, for your own object instantiations that you do inside the lambdas that you provide to Spark. So it's not RDDs, it's not anything managed by Spark, it's your own codes, it's your own memory that, that you use. Um, and then there is the storage memory, and this is where caching goes. And this storage memory is basically a parameter you define to Spark, which is called a memory fraction or something like that. And so it's basically going to be everything here but these two parts time the memory fraction. And then there is the other part, which is the execution memory, which is basically the rest. So you define the memory fraction and whatever is left goes, dear, goes here. And then execution memory is important because it's what will be used by shuffling. So I didn't really go into shuffling, but you probably know it's going to be a huge sort. And when you sort huge amount of data, you're probably going to have to do an external sort, an external merge sort, keep some memory, hash tables, something like that. So these auxiliary data structures go all here. And if you can shuffle fully in memory, it's going to go ablaze. It's going to be really flat, fast and much better. If, if this portion of the data is really small and you're very greedy and caching and requiring lots of things to go here into cache, then your shuffles will hurt. But if you know that your program has no shuffles, then maybe you can basically set these full to 90% of these amounts and cache a lot more data and no, not suffer any problem. Of course, if you know your, your graph is linear, there's no need to cache, and you have a shuffle, then you can do the other way around. So the good news is, so, or, or even on the other way, if you, the bad news is if you're using Spark below 1.6, basically you have to configure this balance. It's going to be in the configuration before the job starts, so you have to do it for each job, it's a bit of a pain. If you have Spark 1.6 onwards, 
then this is going to be decided automatically by the runtime of Spark. You can still provide the value, it's kind of an initialization value, and then Spark will blend this um, uh, boundary here and may push it back and forward as needed. So if you start caching a lot, Spark will kind of break the invariant, steal memory from the execution if possible. So things have improved a bit over there, gladly. Um, because uh, try explaining this to data scientists who come from economical backgrounds and, and this will be a bit difficult for them to understand how to configure this. But, uh, but well. And so, um, finally, there's another problem. So I've basically been telling you how to write your programs in a better way or configuring them. But then there's also a bit of a more deployment side of things. So maybe this is more a DevOps thing or someone is controlling your cluster, which is how to properly allocate resources to a Spark job. So I put that image in the beginning with Homer Simpson and the full dashboard of buttons because Spark is starting to feel a bit like that. So like in the old time you had DBA, I think it won't be much time before we have DBAs for Spark and whatnot because it's starting to be huge knobbing, um, tuning knob machine. And, um, and so just to try to provide a high level overview of what you may have to think about, um, let's just do a, give a quick example. So if you have 10 machines in your cluster and they have 16 cores and 100 gigabits of, of memory and one disk it, so the disk is important because if you have an HDFS, you have to worry about the throughput that, he, that your HDFS is able to give. And, um, and now we want to basically decide which configuration is better. So basically there will be three configurations here and uh, let's maybe look over them and, and reason why one is better than the other. So let's say that you decide to use the least possible number of executors. So here you're going to say each executor will have 16 cores, 100 gigs of memory, and you'll have 10 executors. So you can run 160 Spark tasks because each one typically uses a core, and, uh, and that's it. Another contrasting alternative is most executors as possible. So basically you dump down each executor to one core, it's a really simple one, and you give it a, a bit of, a, of the memory and then you add all this up and you still have the same amount of tasks, but uh, you have a much larger number of executors. So the problem with, with this one over here is that you basically ignore or disallow any hardware parallelism on each executor. And the Spark executor is written in a way that it benefits from being parallel. So if you have some tasks which have an unbalanced usage of data and some tasks need more data, others need less data and they maybe need more, core, more CP usage and they are in the same executor, they can use the resources better. If you split it in this way, basically you're giving a very fixed small unit of resources to each one and now the memory hungry task will not succeed and the CPU hungry task will be very slow would be better if they were in the same executor and balancing out each other. However, the fact that you can make very fat executors is not, is not very good either because the Spark inside the executor will be managing pools of threads to try to reach out to um, Hadoop and, or, or whatever other database or distributed file system you have the memory, the data in. And if you have very fat executors, um, it, the, the whole amount of cores that are in there will be competing a lot with each other to access the data and also to the shuffle machinery because the shuffle machinery is, is shared in part through all the cores in the same executor. So you can see that going to the extremes has disadvantages in each case. So you can pretty much guess that the solution here is not uh, an extreme one. And so here the idea is that I came up with some magic numbers and I'll go through the answer there but is actually that you will not be fully using the cluster. You will have a kind of medium grained uh, executors and the rationale is more or less the following. So you usually should leave in each machine a couple of cores to the operating system, resource manager of your Spark or Hadoop uh, cluster and uh, the whatever data node manager you have if it's HDFS or other. You should also leave some amount of memory for the same reason. These are pretty obvious things for sysadmins or DevOps. And then you should never have more than five cores per executor. And this is to avoid saturating the connections to HDFS. This was measured in practice by several studies and it's more of a disadvantage on the Hadoop limitation. It's a more of a limitation of the Hadoop side than Spark, but uh, it's live. So you should work out with that. 
And also then you have to be aware that the application manager I talked about in the beginning also has to live in your cluster, so you have to account for it. So summing these all together, it kind of boils down to this. And then you can actually drill down and come up with even better numbers depending on your workloads. But you, you see, it's not obvious when you're going to deploy unless you have some experience already. And then you're actually deploying and now the system is running and it starts to bring out alarms or things like, basically, if you have a distributed system, you know that it's really hard to monitor. So any distributed system falls into this category, Spark is not an exception. And the drama there is that you have like these 10,000 of tasks that are executing and you have this Spark dashboard which doesn't really give you any, S, like any query language to go through it automatically. It's just a point and click UI. So if you're using the default dashboard and you're trying to understand if a job is failing or why, you're going to do a lot of clicks and it's really unpleasant. So there are a couple of tools, some of them are paid by companies which are making money out of this, but, um, but you can write your own because Spark exports metrics. So basically, you can get everything programmatically and then create a UI to maybe drill down to a Spark job with some uh, SQL-ish kind of language. So I, I've had to do that and it really helps because otherwise for a large enough job, you're just not going to understand what's wrong via the UI. And uh, so this actually boils down to the second point and one of the things that has caused us many pains is data skew. So when you're having these group buys and joins, your data is going to be typically shuffled given some key and in any realistic data set in the world, you'll always have some skew and skew is a big enemy because it creates stragglers, it uh, ruins your memory allocations because now you wish some of the times, some of the machines had a very large memory, but others have a smaller one so that they better fit the hints that I gave for deploying the system. Basically, I could write a book on horror stories about this, and I'm sure that if you use Spark and deploy it, you could do the same. So uh, let's talk a bit about it if you, if you want to exchange some, some stories, but I want to bore you guys to death, so I think this is an, enough for you to wrap up, go home, and maybe use Spark if you've never used it or apply it and improve your system if you already have one running. So in a nutshell, Spark allows you to basically take these huge data sets and process them effectively. It's really important if your users are not very tech savvy. And data scientists come from many backgrounds. In, at FITZA you have people from all kinds of backgrounds, economics, bio, and, and maths and all, all others, they don't really know how to program that much, but they have very good theoretical knowledge for processing the data. And Spark enables them to do that much easier. And so this is part of their daily life, and for any sufficiently complex system, you have a lot of problems. This is the ones we look at today, so maybe just remember these bullet points, so if you are a Spark system running, go double check that you're doing the right thing on each one of these. And uh, hopefully this awareness will save you time and bring you money, which is the ultimate goal of any company. So uh, thank you for your attention and uh, I'll be open to any questions. So uh, you showed on, the, on one of the first slides uh, the different phases of the life cycle of your data. For yeah. which one of those do you actually use uh, Spark for? So we use Spark all for of all of these. Oh, yeah. okay. so, so all of those. It is very often the case that on these uh, data understanding part, they may use other tools because they want to do this ad hoc algorithm, which maybe they know to do in pandas, and the okay. data that they're working with is very small now. But in general, if they're working with the full data sets, since they are multi-terabyte, they just can't do it with those more traditional tools like like Pandas or IPython, unless they connect it to a cluster, there's some ways to do it. Okay, so but except that one, everything else usually is. Yeah, because we have a, a, a platform for this part, which has uh, our own machine learning algorithms and others from like H2O, I don't know if anyone mm -hmm. here works okay. with machine learning, and, or Weka or others. And uh, here we have um, a platform which gives more things than Spark can give you, and so they go to our platform, which underneath is using Spark, they okay. just don't really interact with it directly. And, and typically, to get there, they will do things that may use our platform and use Spark indirectly or use Spark directly. But the whole picture basically has Spark underneath. 
Uh, and you said you talked you talked about locating executors with the data. Is that uh, something that Apache, uh, Apache Spark does for you already? Yeah, so Spark tries to be smart about that. So and it's not that. so the executor. So if you deploy your cluster in a way that you allow executors to be collocated with the data, then what Spark will do is be smart about where it puts the tasks, the Spark tasks. So if you have two executors, it will choose the one which is less busy but has a good balance in terms of data colocality for the task. So it's a scheduling, distributed scheduling problem, but uh, Spark has their own implementation algorithms and even public papers about how they do that. And how the hell did you debug all of those issues that you found? So yeah, as I said in the later um, slides, many times manually going through the logs and looking logs? at... Yeah. So There's no profiler that you can use? Or unfortunately, like the landscape on, on Spark is still that either you pay big money for some company to give you a system to do that, and there's a couple of them, or you have to do it manually, which we have done mostly so far, or you can write your own tool, which is what we're starting to do. So if you scale Spark big enough in your company, most likely you will either want to pay these companies uh -huh. or write your own system because it's really important. But, Otherwise, but your own tool only works on the data that already comes out from Spark, right? No, it, no. basically Spark exports what is called metrics. It's the okay. name they, they give to it. And you can hook up uh, your own system to those metrics. There are various kind of data like okay. how many tasks are active in a given executor, which machines, how many sh megabytes of data have they processed. Like it goes to a really detailed level. And you can do anything you want to with these. Like you can build a new uh, Spark UI. The one they have is built on top of that Matrix API. Um, and or you can do a, a better uh, UI that maybe allows for querying or something like that. Okay. Which is what I advise. What I'm trying to do. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Uh, hi. How do you usually lead with the distinct counting problem, which is a big deal when you have lots of data? Yeah, so um, this is one of those questions where, unfortunately, we have uh, our own in-house solution for that, which I cannot describe. I, I know this happened in the previous talk. I tried to be a bit more technical here. But for that question, it's a real problem. I know what you're saying. Uh, we have come up with a solution which I, unfortunately, cannot disclose. But it doesn't use Spark for that. So we have. Uh, this I can tell, we have our own streaming processing engine because at Fidzai we have like a real-time pipeline which has like, let's say, five nines um, of percentile under a given number of milliseconds, like five, ten milliseconds. And uh, for that we have our own processing data streaming engine and we have uh, algorithms that work with that there and which we have applied for our batch processing, which is what we were talking about in this presentation. Um, yeah, sorry. Since you are speaking about streaming, why didn't you use Spark streaming? So you're asking why didn't we use Spark streaming? Yeah. So because these, for the life of a data scientist, they are working on historical data. It's full batch, so Spark is really good at that because Spark was built as a batch processing engine. Uh, Spark does have streaming uh, engine, but it's basically a mini batch system. So for each uh, that bunch of events coming, it will get them together, create a small batch, and process it. And you cannot get, for a reasonably scaled system, uh, latencies lower than, let's say, one second. You can get maybe to half a second, but it will be because your system is not having a huge throughput. Um, and for us, we work at a, a, a more lower latency scale. So as I was saying, we have clients where the order of magnitude is something like five nines, uh, five, ten milliseconds. So for that, Spark streaming just doesn't work. And that's why we have our own streaming engine for that. More recently, there's a couple of systems which have appeared uh, after our solution was done in-house. For instance, uh, Apache Flink. I don't know if you know about it, which was, it's kind of the contrary of Spark. Flink was devised as a streaming engine, which now allows to do batch, whereas Spark was the other way around. And Flink, like Storm, I don't know if you know Storm from Twitter, they allow to do laten low latency processing. We've tested them. They are much better than Spark. Unfortunately, they are still not as good as we need. Um, so, yeah, when you have a really very niche tailored use case, it's difficult that these general purpose systems work as good as you need them to be. 
Um, but uh, it's not to say that if we were to devote one year of contributions to those systems, we could make them work as we want. Uh, that's uh, more uh, senior management and marketing decisions. Uh, but of course, it can all be done. It's just a matter of where you want to direct manpower. Any other questions? No? All right. All right, guys. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming.